This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. And welcome to the x everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I'm going to be your host and your guide as together we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the x It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And the x comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern, and then the show is repeated in its entirety from 2 a.m. until 6 a.m. on the x Broadcast Network and on the Talkstar Radio Network and your local affiliate. And the x Nation is growing at a speed that we just cannot believe. We have affiliates across Canada, the United States, Central America, the Caribbean, South America, the Pacific Rim, Asia, Africa, and Europe. The x is truly a worldwide radio show, and some people are calling it a worldwide phenomenon. On our website at www.exxonradiotv.com, we had a poll asking you, the Exo Nation, what first hour you would like as our Valentine gift to you. Well, the results were in last night and the production staff uh, tabulated everything and we found out that you wanted a show on 2012. So I decided to go back in our archives and uh, bring forward an interview that I did last year with Alexander Bruce, who takes a scientific look at 2012. That's an hour number one. Hour number two, Barry Rothman returns talking about the single scene and Valentine's. Hour number three, Dr. Tracy Latz is back to talk about In Defense of Jealous Lovers, another Valentine special. And in hour number four, Dr. Love himself, the inventor of Synchro Hearts, Dr. Bobby O'Neill will be joining us. That's tonight here on the x If you'd like to send us an email, our email address is xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. You can always chat with someone here in our studios 24 hours a day by typing in the MSN address, xzoneradiotv at hotmail.com. And our website's www.xzoneradiotv.com. And to listen and watch the x Radio Show, Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. www.xzonetv.com Valentine's Day is in a couple of days from now, and I hope that everyone remember to get their Valentine's Day cards, their flowers ordered. And uh, don't forget the all-essential box of chocolates. Now, here's some interesting uh, statistics, Exxon Nation, about Valentine's Day. 15% of U.S. women send themselves flowers on Valentine's Day. That's pretty sad, guys. 73% of people who buy flowers for Valentine's Day are men, while 27% are women. Yeah, my wife gives me flowers on Valentine's Day. I think it's really neat. Now, about 1 billion Valentine's Day cards will be exchanged this year. That's the largest seasonal card-sending occasion of the year. That's next to Christmas, of course. About 3% of pet owners will give a Valentine's Day gift to their dogs, cats, and other pets. Personally, I think that's going overboard. Alexander Graham Bell applied for his patent on the telephone, an improvement in telegraphy, on Valentine's Day in 1876. California produces 60% of American roses, but the vast number sold on Valentine's Day in the United States are imported from South America, Approximately 110 million roses, the majority red, will be sold within a three-day period. Cupid, another symbol of Valentine's Day, became associated with uh, it because he was the son of Venus, the Roman god of love and beauty. Cupid often appears on Valentine cards holding a bow and arrow because he is believed to use magical arrows to inspire the feeling of love. And finally, during the late 1800s, postage rates around the world dropped 
and the obscene Valentine Day card became popular despite the Victorian era being otherwise very prudish. As the numbers of racy Valentines grew, several countries banned the practice of exchanging Valentine's cards. During this period, Chicago's post office rejected more than 25,000 cards on the grounds that they were so indecent they were not fit to be carried through the U.S. mail. When I come back on the other side of this commercial break in two minutes, I will be joined by Alexandra Bruce. Now, this is a pre-recorded uh, interview, as the others tonight. So sit back, listen, and enjoy. And from everyone here at the X Zone to each and every one of you out there, a very, very happy Valentine's Day. We'll be back on the other side, right here on the X Zone Broadcast Network and Talk Star Radio. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. And welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. Alexander Bruce is my special guest this hour, and we're going to be talking about 2012. And Alexander, welcome to the Exxon. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Boy, thank you uh, for having me. Um, I am half Brazilian. I'm half American. I've spent some time, quite a bit of time in Canada uh, since I was little. I have many friends in Toronto. I enjoy camping and have had the most incredible experience camping in the Georgian Bay, a small island there, Mm -hmm. during the 2003 blackout. um, We had rowed back after two weeks um, to go to drive back to New York, and when they tried to swipe our card, it wouldn't go through, and they realized that they were on auxiliary power, so we said, we'll we'll come back, we'll go to the grocery store and come back. And then, then we heard on the radio in the supermarket that there was an... The entire Northeast from Quebec to Ohio was out of power. And so everything was still fine. The ice was still perfect. And it had just happened. So we reloaded our, our um, coolers with groceries and rode back out to the island with our friends and rode out the uh, blackout for another week on Pig Dog Island, as we call it. And uh, it's so beautiful. And yes, so, it's, such a, it's like a secret that only Midwesterners know about, the, the beautiful Great Lakes area. Um, it was just fantastic. It's like the Aegean, the color of the water over there. It was just fabulous. But it's very so, cold water. Well, not in August. It's it was perfect. It's like 85 degrees in August, the water. Really? Yeah, over there. You should check it out. Killarney uh, Provincial Park. It's fantastic. Now tell me, where did your interest in 2012 come from? Well, the first time I heard about it was at a lecture given by Terence McKenna, who was mm-hmm. one of the most uh, beguiling public speakers in history, perhaps. And he was talking about the end of time and and um, this sort of acceleration of, of novelty into some kind of cosmic singularity that was not the, the singularity that the futurist Ray Kurzweil talks mm-hmm. about, but some kind of a like dimensional singularity and it just really piqued my interest and it's been this sort of urban legend that's been percolating in sort of the new age community for some 20 years but it was really uh, that I was commissioned to write this book by Gary Badley, uh, CEO of Disinformation Company who directed um, a documentary, co-directed or produced documentary by the same title. So this is, my book is a companion book to his film but it goes far deeper into um, the subject matter than his film can because that's what books do. And really my takeaway from the whole experience was that A, first of all, it's not the end of the Maya calendar, which is so Mm -hmm. often what people are calling it. It's not. It's 
it's no more the end of the Maya calendar than the Gregorian calendar was going to end at any time. It's the end of a cycle. That's right. The same way. What it is, is it's really more akin to um, Western astrology, where we're supposedly um, going from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. But because we're a little less precise than the Maya were, um, we you know, haven't really decided exactly when that's happening. There's some people who say that um, the age of Aquarius started 600 years ago. Others say that it's starting 600 years from now, which averages out to now. So let's, we may as well just call it now um, that we are, we are now in the age of Aquarius. <laughs> so, so, tell me, so tell me, why, why is everybody buying into this doom and gloom crap? Well, I think that we've had a lot of doom and uh, gloom crap in our lives for several decades with the invention of the atom bomb and, and also these increasing uh, uh, concerns about climate change. Um, so, and I think it's, it's a combination of the eerie accuracy of the, Aya, the, the Maya timekeeping, um, that they were able to predict eclipses thousands of years into the past and the future, and this sort of, uh, uh Protestant beliefs about the end times, mm-hmm. Which is probably more what it has to do with than anything. Well, and, what does it tell us about and, society who's so involved in wanting the world to end instead of getting off their lazy behinds and making something positive happen? Yeah, uh, what a wonderful statement. Um, I heartily agree with you. Uh, gosh, I mean, this is um, actually what, what um, John Major Jenkins, who is mm-hmm. one of the first Westerners to introduce the whole meme of 2012 to the West, who uh, came out with a book called Maya Cosmogenesis in 1998. We've actually, I've uh, co-produced the film version of of that book that really presents his um, takeaway of, uh, you know, his life work, essentially, uh, studying um, the Maya cosmology, etc. And, um, he says that really the best thing to make of 2012 is is to participate in creating a better world and you know becoming more responsible for our mm-hmm. methods of consumption and production and uh, you know participate make it make it be what we want it to be instead of some you know fire and brimstone exactly situation you know I, yeah. I, I think I think 2012 is going to be the exact same results as y2k. Yeah. Where everybody's going to get super hyped. There's going to be a lot of uh, elderly people panicking, and uh, now with the the combination of Planet X, the combination of the apocalypse, the combination of the the end of the Mayan calendar, you know, you've got you've got everybody in the uh, in the apocalyptic realm, uh, uh, you know, smiling from ear to ear because they're finally getting the recognition that they've been so desperately seeking. But come December the twenty second, twenty twelve, they're all going to be wearing. They're all going to be wearing crow because nothing is going to happen. And personally, I'd love to see each and every one of these people who are profiting from this doom and gloom arrested, thrown in jail, and the key tossed away. <laughs> well, I, I, I would would agree with you, except that I'm, I'm one of them. But the thing is, my book is really focused more on mm-hmm. the very interesting uh, astrophysical and geophysical things that are happening and, and the discoveries in science that are occurring at this time. And I really do think that 2012 is not about 2012. It's about us today. Exactly. And, you know, and, and self-responsibility ultimately. You see, I I don't put you in that category that I want to throw in jail, by the way, I want to take the charlatans that are out there that are feeding (laughs) off the fear of people and saying, well, you know, if you buy this generator, if you buy this gold, if you buy these, this frozen food, if you buy this doomsday shelter, Right. You know, if you buy your way into a better tomorrow, I'm sorry, I don't go for that. I, I have to agree with you there. Um, but I do think it, it's very interesting mm-hmm. that um, uh, there have been a lot of recent discoveries that are, that are uh, you know, I mean, for one, it hasn't been touted in the press, but if you really look it up, it's there. Um, since for last November, we've been, the whole entire solar system has been moving through a galactic arm, I guess, mm-hmm. of the Milky Way that 
has exposed us to higher levels of cosmic radiation than ever recorded, and it's been ongoing for a year straight now. Yes, but the and, people at NASA and universities around the world are, are telling everyone that because of our atmosphere, we're safe. Because well, well, the, the, the radiation that is coming towards this planet now measures on a very small scale compared to the, the uh, solar flares that we're constantly exposed to. Well, that's good news, except for that what, one of the effects of this radiation is that it is dampening down the heliosphere, which protects the cellular system, as well as the magnetosphere that protects the Earth. And there have been enormous cracks discovered uh, because it appears that uh, we may be in the middle of a geo uh, um, what am I trying to say geomagnetic reversal uh, and historically it's been a very um, it's not cyclical like the sun mm -hmm. it happens on the you know clock yeah. every 11 years on the sun um, a geomagnetic reversal but in the case of earth it's been very erratic um, it often takes up to 5,000 years, but there was one event where an asteroid hit us, it landed in Germany, and there was an instantaneous geomagnetic reversal. So um, w what that means is that our shields will have been somewhat down and allowed. There's been days where the entire um, daytime side of the earth has been entirely exposed to without any magne you know magnetospheric mm. protection or um, or any or any disruption as well because as well, that, soon that's as true too because that, that's one of the biggest concerns exactly. is that we're so dependent on on satellites and electricity for everything in our civilization mm -hmm. that if that were imperiled that could lead to you know a lot of problems but you know you're we're, right we're all aware that there's a galactic alignment that is that is scheduled for December the 21st, 2012. You know, it's, it's going to happen. It happens like clockwork. However, this is the first time in this society's experience that they are going to be part of something this mysterious. What is going to happen? How is this going to affect us? And taking the galactic alignment, the Nibiru Planet X myth, the end of the Mayan calendar, because nobody forgot to, everyone forgot to tell these people who are going crazy that it's the end of the calendar, that it starts again. You know, I think the circle of the calendar is a big hint myself, but, you know, I, don't, I really don't know. And then you've got the people who are the Bible thumping now that it's the apocalypse. Guys, give yeah. your head a shake. Pay your yeah. bills, pay your mortgage, because come December the 22nd, 2012, you're going to be here, and I'm going to be calling each and every one of you and saying, what happened? Alexander, you and I have to take a two-minute commercial break, please. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a news break with the with a couple of commercials. We'll be gone for about four minutes. Alexandra Bruce is our special guest, XO Nation. one 610 7035 is toll-free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii, and the rest of the world now. Email exxon at exxonradiotv.com on MSN Messenger, TV at hotmail.com, and our websites, www.exxonradio.com. TV.com. For more information on Alexandra, here's her website. Actually, it's a um, it's a Facebook, right? We'll give you the Facebook well, on the other side when we come back, right here live and around the world on Talkstar. Don't go away. We'll be back right after this news break. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Oh yeah, just what every parent wants to see under the Christmas tree is a hippopotamus. Mm. Mm. I think whoever wrote that had a little bit... Egg, uh, too much eggnog to drink. Hey, Alexandra, Ooh. welcome back. Nice having you with us. Uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your very busy day to join us here. Hi. And uh, Exxon Nation, if you'd like to order Alexandra's book, it's very simple. You go to www.amazon.com, put in Alexandra Bruce, 
and the books that she writes will pop up or you can go to Google at, uh, you know, Google and just Google her. And uh, thanks very much again for being with us. Now, do you think that the 2012 hype is going to escalate a lot more or do you think that it's going to kind of peak and then stay at a steady stream until 2012? Uh, I wish I, you know, I'm not a psychic, so I can't really, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question. Um, hard to say, mm -hmm. hard to, but you know, I think that maybe it, it depends on, I think the economic recovery, whether it happens or not. So, and it, if it doesn't, I think people will really start to buy more into it. So yeah. as, as the author of a book that asks a very interesting question, 2012, Science or Superstition, is 2012 science, superstition, or both? I love these questions because, you know, we're, we're so Cartesian and, you know, it's like, is it either or? And mm -hmm. I love that you said both. I love My answer to everything is all of the above, you know. Be and my, my book focuses is on the science aspect much more than the others and um, I really go I take a concept that was prevented presented initially in 1975 by MIT professor Giorgio de Santillana and a German professor um, von de Schend right. and that's called Hamlet's Mill in which they proposed that um, ancient myths are actually a coded priestly language to describe celestial events and knowledge because you have to remember that this was before science and the language of science and so they had to they found a way to to turn these you know celestial knowledge into stories and so there is a interdisciplinary science group called the Holocene Impact Working Group that is headed up by a woman named uh, Dallas Abbott, who's from uh, Columbia University, in New York, um, and basically they, they say that like half kilometer wide uh, asteroids strike the surface of the Earth on a pretty regular basis, mm -hmm. and they found several of them, and they actually have traced many famous legends to these impacts. Uh, and they've actually, they believe they've pinpointed the actual uh, location and exact day uh, of an asteroid impact in the southern Pacific off the coast of Madagascar that they believe is the cause of the Noah, the flood of Noah that appears not only in uh, Sumerian myth, but in Greek myth in the story of Zilkalion and in some 4,500 myths globally. So it was a global event mm -hmm. that lofted tons and tons and tons of ocean water into the atmosphere and took the proverbial 40 days and 40 nights to rain back down upon the earth, which salt water it does not do wonders for crops, resulting in famine and death. And um, that's probably, uh, you know, it's a good, it's a good candidate for, for what Noah's flood it was, you know, massive rain of, of salt water and, and um, crop failure. And Bruce Massey at Los Alamos believes that this occurred on um, May 2807 BC, my book. And then I, I created a table of the various uh, um, craters that they're exploring right now that have occurred in the last uh, 13,000 years and um, and it's very interesting to find, you know, ancient Greek legends about um, like Phaeton. Mm -hmm. You may know the story of Phaeton, who was the son of the Greek sun god Helios and a mortal woman. And I guess he was spending his uh, whatever uh, his uh, his weekend with his dad. And um, he said, Dad, if you really want to prove that you love me, let me drive the chariot for the day. And of course, he crashes it. And Zeus gets extra mad at him and throws his thunderbolt at him and makes sure he dies. And um, they've the, the Greeks figured that the chariot landed somewhat north of them. And the this Holocene Impact Working Group believes that they found the location in Bavaria, in a place called Kingau. And there's a there's a lake there called Tutensee which they believe is the final resting place of that comet. So I think that that's, it's just something very 
beautifully holistic about the whole thing because it's an ancient Greek legend, mm -hmm. and there it is, and there's a lake to this day. And there's uh, another thing, another very interesting story brought up by, uh, proposed by some um, aeronautics majors at the University of Bristol, where they found a copy of a Sumerian tablet at the British Museum because uh, the, the Sumerians, like, like the Maya, were also very keen on charting the movements, the celestial movements, and whatever was happening in, in the sky. So the night watchmen, as you, if you will, were noting events. And on a particular night, they, uh, a comet or an asteroid came in at a very steep angle and broiled much of the Middle East and uh, ended up plowing into the Alps in the, um, Aust the Tyrolean Alps in, in Austria, mm -hmm. dislodging some three kilometers of square kilometers of, of mountainside and, um, and is linked to the biblical Sodom and Gomorrah story. So there you have something that's recorded in biblical legend. It's got uh, you know, evidence in the Alps of Austria, mm -hmm. and it's on the Sumerian tablet also. So I think that's these are some of the very interesting things that you know I discover in my book that I discovered in my journey of looking into you know 2012 and what it may portend. You know, and I think that probably in, even NASA says it. You know, if anything, uh, we should be worried about the asteroids that we don't know about and. To this end, actually, they've launched um, or will be launching, say they're launching, I don't know if it's been delayed because that has happened, um, a new infrared telescope mm -hmm. that can see uh, things because most telescopes um, can only see things that emit photons or X-rays or gamma rays or, you know, other, you know, bandwidths, but not infrared and um, so this would be able to see any planet X's that may be out there, or perhaps what may be um, a dwarf twin to our sun, which may be the actual cause of the precession of the equinoxes. Which All is right, what, so, um, so then you're coming into the planet X theory. Yes. Well, somewhat, because planet X is like a conflation of many things. Sure and. Is, yeah. Um, I think that Zeta Talk in, 19, in uh, 2003 were the last date setters for the end of the world mm -hmm. based on Planet X, um, you know, the, the, in between Y2K and now. And, of course, it didn't happen. And, um, and it, it, this was Zeta Talk was basing its information on the work of Zechariah Sitchin. Yeah, and even Sitchin now is saying, wait a minute, guys, you've got it all wrong. I never said that the world was going to end in 2012. Well, furthermore, he said that the last time that Planet X passed was some 900 years or 600 years ago. So we don't have anything to worry about that for another, you know, 3,000 years, according to his whole, uh, you know, mm -hmm. system. So, um, but what I do find interesting is, is the work of Walter Cruttenden, which is mentioned in my book and in the film. Walter's a great guy. Yeah, and I do think, you know, what's very interesting is that, for example, um, the Perseids and other mm -hmm. meteor showers that we go through have not precessed. The things that are, the, the Torrid complex, which is uh, the largest stream of matter in the inner solar system, which is left over from Comet Enki, mm -hmm. which is has been, according to the Royal Observatory, the two guys there who've written many books, um, um, uh, I'm forgetting their names now. They're not at the tip of my tongue, but they're very, you know, this is the Royal Observatory, okay, of, of, the, of the United Kingdom. And they've been saying that Comet Enki has been pretty much breaking up over our heads for the past 30,000 years, and it's probably the source of many of these uh, legends, like the one I just told you about, about the Phaeton Comet. You know, but I and, think, I think, yeah, I think, let's just stop for a sec and ask a major question. Where mm -hmm. did the ancients get all this wisdom that has taken the 20th century, the use of telescopes, satellites, computers, and yet the ancients were doing it without any technology at all? Where did they get the, where did they get the knowledge? Well, evidently, they, 
they had access to something that we don't. And uh, whether it's um, on a level of consciousness or in a level of t- technology is remains to be seen. But um, one of the interesting uh, things also that came out of, you know, we conflate a lot of the flood legends. Mm-hmm. And uh, the end of the last ice age is a very murky uh, area in the world of geology. There's a lot of um, disagreement and contention, as it, which is the definition of science itself. It's just one big contentious uh, situation. I love science, but uh, that's that's what it's all about. It's a, you know proving your theory and proving mm-hmm. other people wrong, etc. But um, what appears to have occurred, um, according to Paul Violet and others, uh, Richard Firestone and others, look this up, it's all in my book, is that something hit us uh, probably in the Great Lakes area that melted what was then a three-mile thick uh, layer of ice and raised the global sea level um, three to four hundred feet. So any coastal settlement at that time was was inundated under three to four hundred feet of water. So maybe Atlantis is not a particular location so much as it was a period of time before those areas became, you know, globally inundated. So, so tell me, do you think that the planet Earth is actually losing its mojo? <laughs> well, it, there there are indications that it is, and by mojo I mean the mm-hmm. magnetosphere, which we were discussing prior to the last break. Uh, yes, um, it is the gauss that the Earth is emitting is like an eighth of what, of what it was during the era of the dinosaurs and may have something to do with the size of animals mm-hmm. back then versus how big they are now. And that was another big thing that happened during the, the um, last, the end of the last ice age was this um, mass extinction of megafauna, which were mammalians that are huge. There were giant sloths that were like five tons in size and the last of those perished on the island of cuba as recently as the 1500s which is sort of an interesting factoid but most of them were you know a lot of these there were woolly rhinoceroses there were giraffes Mm -hmm. in siberia and what you have is like they're unearthing what appear to be flash frozen mammoths with intact trunks and eyes and skin and hair um that indicate that something extremely rapid, I think that there was an interview done with the guy, the engineer at Bird's Eye, you know, who freezes vegetables and knows what it takes to freeze tons of vegetables. And it, it, you know, it was something on the order of it had to have happened so rapidly in order for this level of preservation to occur where you have mammoths with like buttercups frozen in their mouths, you know. So something catastrophic happened and uh, the, the, North Pole was shifted some 30 degrees, and there is like a huge nebulosity in the world of science around. Um, and there was Charles Hapgood who advanced his Earth crust displacement theory that was, uh, I believe, in the late 50s. It was the Ford, it was endorsed, and the Ford was written by Albert Einstein, mm. um, but was later replaced by what is now you know, the, the the accepted theory of plate tectonics and subduction and uh, upwelling and spreading of, you know... Yeah, you see, I, I, I believe in the theory, uh, uh, that theory, but I also know for a fact that based on the fact that we're taking oil out from under the tectonic plates, we're actually taking the oil out of the Earth's natural hydraulic system, and we're going to be causing a lot of problems unless we find another solution to replace the fluid that we've been taking out of the Earth. I agree with you. There are actual areas of Texas that are collapsing um, because they've taken all the oil out, and like neighborhoods and and just entire you know cities are just getting you know it's it's true. I mean, Alexander, you and I have to take yes. our commercial break. Please stand by. Alexander okay. Bruce is our special guest, Exxon Nation. To find out all about this young lady, it's very simple. Go to Amazon.com. Type in Alexander Bruce. Now make sure you're on the book. Uh, icon, or you go to Google, A L E X A N D R A B R U C E, and she's all over the place. 
She's just like the Exxon, global and viral. My name's Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. We'll be back with Alexander Bruce on the other side of this break as we continue from Hamilton. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Alexander Bruce is our very special guest, and uh, Alexander, I want to take this opportunity of thanking you so much for your, uh, joining us uh, this evening here on the Exxon. How can people find out more about you, uh, your book? Is there a blog they can go to? Yes, um, just as you said before, you just dial my name, Alexander Bruce, into the Amazon search engine, click on the first result, which is my latest book, uh, 2012 Science of Superstition. Scroll down, you'll see a picture of me and a link right next to that picture, and click on that, and that will take you to my blog. It'll show you some of the other books I've written. I'm uh, currently working on my seventh book. Mm-hmm. Um, also, you can, if you want to read uh, some chapters of my book for free, there is a website um, for my book, and that is www. 2012sos.net slash the hyphen book and on that page um, there are several you can my book there's a couple chapters for free there if you want to take a look at how would you what, what, would, like. you, what would you like to say to the Exo Nation in the next minute and a half to tie it all up um I say that 2012 can be seen as a, as a great opportunity to to focus on what is really important, which is love and loving your everybody, loving your family starts with yourself and then your family and then your community and loving your work, not doing a job you hate, doing a job you love, doing things with love. Love is the alpha and the omega. That's what I have to say. So what are you going to be doing uh, December the 21st, 2012? I have no idea. I'll probably be partying. Uh, I mean, uh, most likely. <laughs> I'm not worried about it. So you're not going to be wearing a crash helmet or carrying a first aid kit or a bottle of no. oxygen or some I, frozen foods? I, I think that we might probably be seeing hard, harder times mm-hmm. uh, economically before that date. And um, so that, that that's more of a concern to me, to me than, than 2012. But right now I'm doing fine. I'm working hard getting paid not that much but at least i got a job which is something that a lot of people can't say right now that's right um and i and i do love my work and i think that's that's important and i think that you know uh, doing what you love is important and people should try to do that as much as possible and to put love into what they do if they you know try to try to love what you do alexander (laughs) one one more time could you give our listeners your contact information please yes the uh, book website is www.2012sos.net slash the hyphen book. And that gives you um, the page for my book, and, it, and that gives you access to some free chapters of my book and, and a little bit of a blog that's happening there. You can also go to Amazon.com and put my name, Alexandra. A-L-E-X-A-N-D-R-A, and my last name is Bruce, B-R-U-C-E. The first result is my book, 2012 Science or Superstition. Click on that, scroll down on that, buy, buy my book, okay. Or, and uh, if you don't want to do that immediately, you can scroll down further, you'll see a photograph of my face. Next to that photograph is a link to my blog, which shows you some other books that I've Alexandra, written. Alexandra, we've just run out of time for tonight. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Exo Nation, Alexandra Bruce. To find out more about Alexandra, go to Google, type in her name, or go to Amazon.com and type in her name. 
When I come back from this uh, news break at the top of the hour at six and a half minutes past, I'm going to be speaking to Dorothy Cora Moore about the Atlanteans. My name is Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon, and we're coming to you from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, right here on... 